process? And then what are the consequences of you regulating that? Did the patient storm out of the office? Did you get cussed out? Did the patient start weeping in your arms? Literally, that happened a few weeks ago. Um, did the patient not want to get referred out and now they're fixated on you? Like maybe you were a little superhero with them. Um, so really, what consequence? Maybe now you have a colleague who never gives you referrals because of something that interacted with you. Or when you do come to one of these meetings, someone said something months ago and now whenever they speak, you're kind of like, person's a bigot and in your head you're having this conversation but you're not really viewing them as a whole person it really is about you're no longer viewing people holistically you start to look at them as caricatures of their true identity and so we're all super complex and if you're not able to see the complexity of people that has to do with countertransference and so this is also a back and forth process you regulate did it work nah I gotta regulate some more yeah, I think it worked. Now I'm feeling good. I'm excited about work again. Some of the management approaches you can have is one is prevention and monitoring. That's part of CBC. But it's also about reducing these adverse consequences. So prevention and monitoring is all about self-awareness, insight building exercises, reducing adverse consequences, strategic use of self-disclosure. So I might say to a patient, um, I don't know exactly what you're talking about in that experience help me understand a little bit more or what you just said makes me a bit confused let me just take a moment and try and ground myself and understand strategic self-disclosure it might be therapy you know I don't know how often people might consider going to therapy for culture-based countertransference personal therapy but I think it might be a wonderful use I'd love to get that referral in private practice like wouldn't that be amazing like hi I would like to see you to process my cultural biases like that would be beautiful why can't the world be like that um, it also requires courage and vulnerability like talking about this stuff like I put all my business out in the street today you know like just being willing to be vulnerable and being a real person and engaging in this topic and finally really attune supervision like these are things that we can be talking about in supervision I know that that has come up sometimes when I've supervised especially sometimes on the quick consult is counter and stuff going on is it CBC some of the negative or signs rather of ineffective management if you have to revert back to your basic skills if you have to change your entire style of working or the setting your client population not being willing to process any of this in, in personal therapy going to multicultural trainings and really feeling like they're inadequate and you can't really engage them they may have to do with the quality of the training but really not being able to find a space and then limited use of supervision and consultation not really talking these things out um, some of the consequences of not effectively managing it is that therapists, um, the, more, the less resolved these issues are, um, the more likely it's gonna hinder the therapeutic process, especially in our short-term model. We don't have a lot of time for CBC in that 15 to 45 minute visit. It may lead to culturally inappropriate interventions and premature termination. Um, and so when I think about this, it has a lot to do with ethics. Um, I think psychologists are particularly, and I say mental health providers, everyone in mental health, is particularly slated and well-skilled to manage racism, prejudice, bias in our society. I can't think of another profession that is better prepared to tackle this human I guess, infection that we have than psychologists. It's not political science, it's not engineers, it's us, it's behavioral health specialists. And so I do think it's our ethical responsibility to manage this. In your handout, I did include the updated multicultural guidelines. I'm not gonna have us break it up, read and all of that, but I just want you to be aware because some of the guidelines have really um, improved in their sophistication from just awareness, knowledge, and skills of culture. And now um, APA is trying to be a bit more sophisticated. And so some of the ways that you can manage CBCs, number, f number one is strategic self-disclosure, making it clear to patients and to colleagues that culture is relevant to you. This is a space that we talk about all things. One of the things that I've received or heard from people is that, well, if they came in for ADHD, what does race necessarily have to do, maybe race more for ADHD, but what does their sexual orientation have to do with an ADHD referral? 
So I do think um, there are ways that you can invite culture into that. One of the things that I've tried to do over the years is email actual clinical sessions in those notes where that's come up, but we still are focused on the referring issue. Um, but what I found, some people will say, well, the patient didn't bring it up, so it must not be relevant. You would never say that about suicide. You would never say that about sleep. You would never say that about um, weight or diet or birth history. The patient didn't bring it up. Why is that okay if we're talking about culture? So I invite you all to recognize that culture is something that maybe people don't know how much it impacts, it, impacts them because I think of culture like a water to fish. I don't know how much fish are like, I'm, I'm really wet. Like, it's, this water is wet. Like, they're a fish. That's like their whole world. And so sometimes we don't recognize the experience we're actually in. Um, some of the ways that you can anchor yourself when you've had a trigger or had a cultural based counter-transference experience is one, asking yourself, what are your values around this issue that's been triggered? What would you want that patient, that colleague to know, to do, to feel? Like what interaction are you hoping for? What would keep you from speaking up and living your value? So at the last training I did, someone mentioned they were a white provider and it was a white patient and um, the patient had used the N word a couple of times in session and it was kind of like, you know how those people are. And so there was no people of color in the room, but that provider was very triggered as a white person who does not use that language. And so like, what kept that provider from speaking up and living their values? And so at the training, we actually role played that interaction and did a real play um, of what are some ways that you can be authentic in that room. But first, keeping yourself safe um, and then living your value. And so these are just some anchoring questions to help you as you go through that. So in short, you know, I think we have to have the courage to manage these biases, put them on our radar. Um, and if we don't, we're really not being our authentic self. And what is the point of being a mental health provider if you have to be fake? Like I could have gone in a, a higher paying field. Um, like that's like the best part of the job is like you get to be real. Um, and so that is the presentation. Any questions, comments? How many minutes do we have? Like two? Oh, okay. Questions, comments? Yes. Sometimes I struggle a bit because I find that, um, like I'll say, a meeting with a lot of families in my practice are from Bangladesh, uh -huh. and all the families live together, and so if they're coming in often for, let's say, a behavior referral, and they often have issues because other family members aren't on board with not only them saying that the child has an issue, right. but also with actually doing the interventions. And then sometimes I feel like I'm working like with a ghost yeah. that's not in the room mm -hmm. and is almost like sabotaging. Yeah. And I'm sometimes I'm like unsure what to do. Um, this happened the other day, I was speaking with Martha and she's like, oh, invite the grandparents in also. And the person I, I suggested and she's like, no, no, they're not coming in. Like mm -hmm. it's not happening. And this person like didn't come back to treatment because she's like, honestly, I I can't get my family to work with me and it's not working. Like mm -hmm. they're gonna keep doing what they're doing, she's not gonna change her behavior, so I'm not coming back in. Right. And I couldn't get her to bring her So I was like, okay, I mean I don't know really what to do. Yeah, I think that is a really common dilemma. Um, the generational parents in my own clinic I find that the grandparent might have more say than the person that brings the child into the session. And so similar to how you might approach it if it was a mother and the dad wasn't supporting it, I think there's a couple of approaches. You can try education, you know, maybe some materials home. That really doesn't work. Um, I haven't found it to be particularly helpful. I think one of the pieces that I've encouraged patients to think about is like, what can you do? And what can you accept? So like, the reality is you have two sets of grandparents living in your house who are undermining your parenting, what is the point where you can have some power and control in your parenting? And what are the values that you wanna be able to teach your child? You know, simple language things like, well, these are mommy's rules. When you're with Baba, you're with Grandpa, you're with whomever. 
that's with them. This is when you're with me. Like those kind of ways, how can you empower the parent in the space and the power they have? Some people don't have full power and full um, control over their children's lives. That's the reality of a lot of patients. You know, we talk about raising kids in a village. The problem with the village is everybody's in your business. Um, <laughs> it's a great concept, but everybody's raising your child. Um, and so I think it's really about tapping into the power that family member who is with you has. And then also a part of that is bringing in that acceptance and commitment therapy. Like what can they accept? What can we commit to? What can we do in this time? And I mean, part of it is you learning the acceptance and commitment too. Like you probably are not as powerful as two sets of grandparents from Bangladesh. Oh, not at all. I mean, I, I spoke to her for a while on the phone. They already come in twice. Like they were yeah. committed. Um, and I already, she did she missed her session, which is why I was on the phone with her. Yeah. And I mean, I, I understood, right? I mm. even, I called her back. I spoke to Martha. I was just like, why don't you invite the grandparent in? I'm like, that's a good idea. So I even called her back and we had another conversation. It just, mm -hmm. I yeah. I made a decision. She said, I really don't think it's going to work. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to talk her into it. She's like, no, I'm sorry. I don't. I, Wow. And part of that too, that pulls in your MI principles too, like what does it mean for it not to work? Like how can you still be in this situation, be in the house, be with your child and still have a positive relationship and not necessarily feel like you have that mother role that you would like? What's realistic? And so sometimes giving suggestions that won't work will lead to that premature termination versus connecting with that mom and saying like, what is that like right. to say as a parent? I have no power. Right. How can you still have a great relationship and finding those points? How can we have some positive moments in this room when you come here? Maybe here is the space that you can have those, ex those amazing experiences with your kid. And maybe there are other spaces you can create in your life that might not be in your house. Right. I don't know how helpful that is, but that's just kind of what comes to mind as I think through it. Other questions, thoughts, comments? So one of the things that we've been doing at CBC um, is Real Plays, where someone brings in client material and we actually role play different ways that you could respond. Um, we did a round robin last time where we had a patient experience and then everyone went around the room and like kind of tapped in how they would respond in that situation. I think that's a really important thing to engage because oftentimes when we talk about culture-based countertransference, it's in the moment and you're like, dang, I wish I would have said, but you didn't have the language. It is such quick, like you can't, it's not one of those things you can do without like practice. It's like a language. And so if you're somewhere else and you're speaking your second, third, or fourth language, you're not gonna be able to be like, ha ha, and make a really funny joke in the time of that language unless you have a really high level of competency with that language. And so that's what we're really focusing on in CBC is giving that language so you don't have those missed opportunities for connection and then you're like laying in bed that night thinking like, oh, why did I let that go and now am I racist and you're having white guilt or you're having like internalized oppression and that whole process that is exhausting and feels terrible. Um, so that's all I have. Thank you all. Hope this has been helpful. Yeah.